Have you ever heard of Christian fundamentalism? I have. Do you know what it means? Well, I think I do. Every belief system has fundamentals or bedrock principles. It seems logical that one would believe in the fundamentals. So what is Christian fundamentalism? Is it consistent with the historic Christian faith, or does it deviate? Let's put some depth on this subject. Today's topic on Craving Answers, Craving God, Christian Fundamentalism. I'm Chuck Rathert with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor of St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Aaron, I'm familiar with the term Christian fundamentalism, but I must admit that I base my perspective on probably a lot of assumptions. Can you give me your most concise definition? Concise, why, are you, why are you smiling? Well, concise like is tough. I, it's it's like a lot of movements, uh, especially movements that get bad names, pejorative names like fundamentalism. There are people who are inside and outside who want to define them in different ways, to, to define that name in, in different ways, some to defend it, some to attack it. And then, of course, the people who are defending it are always responding to the people who are attacking it. And so, I mean, there's all different kinds of, uh, of different ways that Christian fundamentalists describe themselves, and different Christian fundamentalist groups will think about who they are differently, and and of course, the, even more so, people who attack Christian fundamentalism frequently don't really know what they're talking about. It's just it's turned into kind of a a, a, a pejorative term that you can label somebody in, as a way to sort of shut down the conversation. Well, you're a fundamentalist. Um, I, I will say that I grew up in a brand of Christian fundamentalism, and in my experience there, and if uh, I'll just get this out right away here at the beginning. If anybody's interested in this topic further than what you and I are talking about today, Chuck, um, George Marsden is uh, is a is a church historian who's written extensively about American Christianity and especially uh, fundamentalism and its relationship with the broader culture and its relationship with the broader Christian church. And so, um, I'd recommend you reading George Marsden's books, M A R S D E N. From my experience, though, growing up in in a Christian fundamentalist church, um, there were basically two big parts of it. This is way oversimplifying, but you said concise. There was a belief in certain core Christian doctrines that Christians historically have always believed, and and a commitment to those beliefs. Sounds good to me so far. Attacks on those beliefs, and the second part is a rejection of culture, a rejection of a separation from the culture and from the outside world. That was the second part. Um, and so uh, uh, there were certain ways that you should dress. There's, you don't go to movies. Uh, I was encouraged when I was a kid at the churches that I was at to avoid becoming friends with people who weren't Christians. That, that was a good way to to be pulled away from Christianity. And so that was the part that most people were interested in when – when I talk to my my old friends who grew up in that way, that's the part that we, when we think about fundamentals, we mostly think about this call to be separate, like li- literally separate from the world, not having contact with the world. Is fundamentalism an American phenomenon? Uh, it is largely American. It's largely American. Um, Did it start here? There, there's different strains. There's a couple of st- strains that started. I mean, it would dip, you, so the Christianity part of it, of course, did, and the Christianity part of it uh, it goes back to the beginning of the world, you know. But uh, the the separation part of it is largely an American phenomenon. There's a, a there's a little bit of a British element in it through uh, what's called the the Keswick movement of the late 1800s. And uh, dispensationalism grew out of that. I'm just I'm saying words now that I don't have time or the inclination to define right now. Uh, but thankfully, most of the people who are listening to this have access to Wikipedia. Uh, go knock yourself out. You can find all. Keswick is spelled K E S W I C K. Apparently, I'm going to spell all the words to this this episode. 
and dispensationalism also this this, this kind of grows out of England. The, the Keswick movement. I, I will say something about this real quick. It's the notion that there's a higher life to be had. So Christianity that that you know Christians they believe in Jesus, um, they believe in what the Bible says. But there's a higher life to be experienced when you completely and totally surrender your life to Jesus. And the pursuit of that led to um, revivals and sort of the goal of like uh, living a pure and um, uh, very, very much in touch with Jesus' life, uh, surrendering all to Jesus, that sort of thing. What's wrong with that? Oh, I'm not. I'm, so, I, I'm not saying that. I, I, I still. I, we're not saying there's anything wrong with any of this so far. I, I there, there's a lot of good in all of this. Uh, um, well, you use the term pejorative. Some people, which is a very negative connotation. So I, I guess I was thinking, in my limited understanding of, of fundamentalism, that it was just a a way of approaching the Bible in a very strict sense, but not necessarily over in pejorative territory. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort that out. Yeah. So, so fundamentalist is a word that's used for Islamic terrorist. And frequently in the days following nine 11, I heard a lot of uh, commentators talk about how, the problem, you know, in, in, in trying to defend uh, Islam at large while acknowledging that that what happened on 9-11 was done by people who were doing it in the name of their religion, there's a lot of arguments that religion is fine, but what the problem is, is religious fundamentalists. And Christian fundamentalists were thrown into this boat too. Um, and as a result, they had many fundamentalists had to defend themselves. Many fundamentalists have abandoned the word fundamentalism while still maintaining that just because the word is so it, it's it's uh, it's it's loaded with so much bad freight. Um, so yeah, I'm not. There's a lot of uh, I, I myself in many ways uh, affirm many of the things that fundamentalists affirm. Um, so yeah, I would I would never I, I don't want to say at all that Christian fundamentalism is bad. Um, I disagree with it in some areas, but there, a lot of the areas I, I I still very much hold to. Suppose you and I sat down for lunch in a friendly but serious conversation about religion and faith. I know you do this with with people on various levels, people with whom you're familiar, people whom you've just met, because you're a pastor. Those those kind of meetings take place. And as we talk, you begin to perceive that I'm a Christian fundamentalist. Now, I realize, I know you're going to say, well, you know, you, you wouldn't unload your whole truck on me in at lunch, that it might take more than one meeting, but let's just consolidate here. Are you going to try to influence me or steer me away from my fundamentalism? I, I wouldn't. I, <laughs> I, I totally wouldn't. And this happens. I have friends who... Uh, um, I have friends who I grew up with who are very, very Christian, and I, I want to be very, very Christian too. They think of me, so I, I'm not, I would not describe myself as a fundamentalist anymore. Although, like I said, I agree with a lot of what fundamentalists hold to. Um, they think that me becoming a Lutheran is very much a compromise. Uh, very much uh, uh, an abandoning of um, I, most of them would, would, would allow that I'm still a Christian. Why? Oh my gosh! I uh, why would they do that? That's a gr that's a great question. I, I think it's because in their mind, it's a slide into a slide away from faithfulness to the Bible and towards a, a liberalism. They would associate. Um, they would associate anything that's not in their group with uh, liberalism. I, I would have to, if it came up, first of all, I wouldn't bring it up. I wouldn't say, well, hey, you know, you're, I'm not a fundamentalist anymore, and I'd like to try and talk you out of being a fundamentalist. Because they would, that, that's, they, that's what they would expect me to do. They would assume that I was speaking evil to try and uh, change their minds. I would just leave it alone. I would leave it alone. They're Christian brothers and sisters it's not the juice isn't even worth the squeeze to try and bring something like that up at all ever. But if they bring it up, 
I would have to spend um, a good amount of time showing them I actually do believe in the Bible. I believe in Christianity. I'm still a believer in Jesus. And I, I would just have to hope that they would listen and, and and allow me to have that. And if not, I mean, they could try to convert me. I don't think that's what would happen, though. Most of my friends who who are still fundamentalist would not think of me as, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, backslider away from truth. But they would be very suspicious about me becoming a Lutheran. And um, I, I mostly would just – I don't try to dissuade fundamentalists from being fundamental fun, fundamentalists. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I do like to uh, want to understand them, though, and find out what, what makes them tick, and especially the way they reject culture. And um, I think that that's interesting, and I disagree with that. But um, mostly just kind of leave them alone, keep my head down. So you use the term, I think, when we began here, the term movement – uh, there have been a variety of movements in the church from the beginning, for that matter. Uh, some of those orthodox, some of those uh, unorthodox. When did this movement start? Is there a history? Does it fit into the history of the Christian church? When did it start? I guess it's still going. Uh, where did it start? What can you tell me? It's largely a modern movement. It started as a reaction to... Um, it started as a, re a reaction to what, this is an unfortunate term, but I I've used it already, so I'll use it again, uh, what they perceived as liberalism in the Christian church. In the mid to late 1800s, uh, actually earlier than that, but he, it became more popular in the mid to eight, late 1800s in the United States, and like I said, to some extent in Great Britain, um, many people in the church started abandoning, uh, abandoning core Christian beliefs. They, they, they stayed in the Christian church. I'm talking about uh, schools, by and large, uh, tr training schools for for Christian pastors, uh, Christian pastors as a result of that, and then congregations as a result of that, started abandoning core Christian beliefs. For, for instance, the divinity of Jesus. Um, That's the, really important. The virgin birth of Jesus, uh, 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 the creation of the world as an act of God. Um, the resurrection from the dead, these sorts of things, the inspiration of the Bible. Well, you've just pretty much given it everything there. Yes. And so some churches, uh, many people said, well, you know what? I disagree with that. I'm going to just keep on living what the, living and preaching and teaching and doing what the Bible says to do. I'm going to stay faithful. And the people around me in my church can abandon, but but I'm not going to. But there was a large group of, of people in the United States especially that said, we have to separate from that. We have to pull away from those bad churches and separate and um, start our own churches. So um, the, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA goes liberal, and the PCA, the Presbyter Presbyterian Church in America, was founded. Uh, the American Baptist Church... Uh, starts some in there start to reject core Christian doctrines, and so uh, the Southern Baptist Church and lots of other splinter small Baptist churches are, are, are founded as a result of that. And actually, the Southern Baptist Church is this goes back to some other stuff too. The the affirmation of slavery um, reje rejected by the Northern Baptists that that's into it too. But uh, this happens in, in a lot of diff different denominations. Um, People pull out and start their own denomination and then uh, separate. We have to separate from those denominations. We have to separate from the world. And so it's, 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 a, it's a modern, it's, it's not a problem that came up until the, until the rise of uh, historical criticism in the church and, and theological liberalism. And is it still happening today? Yeah, for sure it's still happening today. Um, it's different than it was. It's a much smaller group because people have – slowly but surely been rejecting the term fundamentalism um, over the past 75 years because of its pejorative nature. And also because I think some of the ideas in it, the ideas of separating from the culture, uh, have proven to be by and large unbiblical. That's, it's not the, Christians are not called to separate from the culture. Christians are called to befriend the sinners. This is what Jesus did. Uh, Paul lived and moved in the cultures. He, yes, he preached in the synagogue, but he also preached in the pagan marketplaces. 
and uh, Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes, not not as an accommodation, as a, not as a compromise, but as an accommodation to them. As he goes to people that need him, and I, I think that the um, I think that the, the core principles behind fundamentalism that Christ is against culture are wrong. And while I agree with what they believe, their practice I disagree with. So let's see if we can narrow this down a little bit. I believe in Adam and Eve. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I believe that that uh, God created the world in in seven days, six days, and rested on the seventh day. Uh, sounds to me like I'm right in line with the fundamentalists on there. But you mentioned applications that involve culture, that involve how you dress and right. whether you go to the movies or not, or what, what those kinds of activities. So are there any significant theological differences as far as what I believe, what you believe, and fundamentalists? Or is it more about, hey, we're free to wear whatever we want within limits, of course. Uh, we don't have to dress in a way that sort of matches the rest of the tribe. That's what I'm, that's what I'm picturing here. So am, am, am I in the ballpark or am I still wandering around in the dark? I think that is a key theological difference. How we relate to the culture around us has to do with our view of God and what God's plan is for the culture around us. And the fundamentalists are wrong. When God says, either Isaiah 52 or 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians as well, uh, come out from among them and be separate, it's not talking about you need to wear your clothes differently. You need to wear different hairstyles than the world around us. You need to not participate in... Uh, um, I remember, I'll say this, and this is going to sound ridiculous. Some of you who are listening who are alive in the 1980s will remember the unfortunate obsession with jams, we called them, like Hawaiian print shorts and, and shirts. And I remember hearing a fundamentalist pastor say, you shouldn't wear jams. And his reason was is because they're popular. And he actually said, in 20 years from now, maybe they won't be popular and you can be safe to wear them. But now when they are popular, to wear them would be an attempt to look like the rest of the world, and we as Christians aren't supposed to. I, I think that's a view of the world that's wrong, that God's world is good, and Jesus died to save the culture. There's a guy, a theologian named Richard Niebuhr, who wrote a book uh, maybe 7,500 years ago now called uh, – Christ and Culture, actually, I take that back, it's more like 70 years ago, wrote, wrote Christ and Culture, and in there he outlines five key ways in which the Christian church has interacted with culture down to the church ages. And that's always a question, how are we going to relate to the non-church around us? And um, one of the ways is Christ against culture, and this is the fundamentalist way, is that God is against culture. He's against the entertainment industry, and he's against the financial industry, and he's against the people who are making the the jams right now, whatever the jams are in our culture. He's against those people, and so we must reject them as well. Come out from them and be separate means don't look like them, don't talk like them, don't act like them. Um, the, the, another one of Niebuhr's paradigms, though, is Christ transforming culture. And it's, it's this idea that the Christian church has had from time to time, which I'm more amenable to, that yes, the culture is broken and sinful. I don't think anybody disagrees with that, even non-Christians. Jesus died to rescue that culture. He, d he died to be, to, to, to be the savior of the world. And does that mean he died to save a few people and take them out of the world? Or does it mean he died to rescue the entire world? That's a theological problem. And if I believe that Jesus died to rescue his creation and to rescue his human creatures, that means I must be salt and light. I must live amongst them. I must be gentle and loving, as Jesus talks about, and as we've talked about in here in a bunch of different episodes. I must um, defend what I believe, but with gentleness and respect, as Peter says in 1 Peter. I must be in and of the people. 
While, so what does it mean then to come out and be separate? It means that I must not engage in the world system. I must not submit to the gods of power and money and sex. I must not believe that through material means I can be satisfied or saved. I must not believe that my salvation depends upon my individual autonomy as an American citizen. I must believe faithfully in Jesus. But I have to do, like, like Daniel and like Esther and like Joseph, I have to do that in the world, interacting with the world, supporting and loving the world with the power of the gospel. I can't separate. Okay, so let's let's go in this direction. The Bible tells the story of how God delivered to Abraham the promises on which we stand today. And if you read the book of Romans, you'll see how Paul makes the distinction between uh, living for the promises of Abraham or in the promises given to Abraham as opposed to doing everything in your power to follow the law that was given to Moses. Stop me if I get any of this wrong. Um, So it's from the time that the faith was delivered to Abraham until today, there have always been people or sects of people who have tried to introduce some law-keeping into the free gift of salvation, which we now understand to be ours in Jesus Christ. Right. And we call that legalism. So if we say, you're, you're, yes, you're saved, you're saved because Jesus died and rose again, but now you have to do certain things in order to complete that salvation yeah. or s- somehow uh, supplement that salvation. Well, I think that would be a problem from our theological perspective. Yes. We are the grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone people. Is that the epicenter of the difficulty with fundamentalism? Because fundamentalists have introduced some kind of law keeping into the salvation equation. Yes, I. So I, I don't know if epicenter is the right word, but you you put your finger on something. Once you start establishing rules like this about the way you should dress or the type of music you should listen to, and, and by the way, there's there's a way to do. Um, the church that I'm in now, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, has the opposite problem. It, it, it tends to sometimes think it doesn't matter how I dress or what movies I go to or how I look. And that's that's an opposite problem. It doesn't take into account that we are called to be holy. Uh, but yes, you've put your finger – so that, the side, that was a side note. You've put your finger on it, Chuck. Once you start adding rules – Look, if you're adding anything to God's word that God has not commanded us, that's wrong. That's legalism. You cannot put on people something that God does not, a rule that God does not put on people. And that's legalism. And one of the big problems that I, that I have to this day, the biggest problem that I have, I will say this, so maybe it is the epicenter, maybe that is a good word, Chuck. The biggest problem I have with the, the, the churches that I grew up in right now is not with the doctrine that they teach in terms of the story of the Bible and whether uh, God is real and Jesus is active and and that God has acted in space and time in history to, to save his world. I agree with all of those things. What I disagree with, though, is this notion that I'm saved by faith in Jesus, but once that happens, I need to start doing a bunch of good deeds to make God happy with me. Or to be right with God, and that's where that Keswick theology I or talked to earn about earlier. His favor. Yes, to, to that 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 notion that there's this higher level. That okay, so you're a Christian. That's great, but now you need to start doing these things, praying this way, having your devotions this amount of time to get up to, to this higher level. And if, and if I say that, I'm not at all denigrating reading the Bible or praying or seeking to live a life that is salt and light in the world. I'm not denigrating that at all, but once you turn that into a set of rules by which I earn God's favor or by which I become sanctified, then you've then you've undermined the gospel. You've said Jesus can do this much, but you have to do the rest of it, and that undermines the gospel. That's an interesting word, undermines. Um, do you think fundamentalists just your average typical fundamentalist is going to go to heaven. He believes in Jesus. He believes he believes in the fundamentals. He believes in Adam and Eve. He believes in 
in many of the things we've talked about already. Um, and maybe he has a legalism which undermines his faith, but it doesn't condemn him, does it? No more than my legalism undermines my faith. Uh, we're all recovering Pharisees. I still like to think that my good sermons have some sort of like intrinsic value. I still like, I'm still proud of myself when I do good things. I still am trying to make God happy with me or to make myself happy with me. I'm still trying to justify myself with my own works. And thankfully, the, the, the love of God for us in Jesus Christ is much, much bigger than our bad theology or our bad practice. Well, well okay, let's just stop on that point for a second. Because you, um, as a Lutheran pastor, know as well as anybody, I would assume, that you are not justified by your works. Right. Period. Yes. And now you say, I'm still trying to do that. And don't get nervous here. I'm not putting you on a pedestal. I get it. That's the way we all are. How do you explain that? Maybe, maybe we have a bigger problem than the fundamentalists have. We know better, and we're still trying to follow that, for lack of a better term, legalistic path and earn just some of God's favor. Well, they know better, too. They have the same Bible, and actually, they read their Bible more than we do. I uh, was was talking to a professor of mine at, um, at the seminary who, like me, came out of a Baptist background, actually was a professor at a Baptist seminary for a long, long time. <clears throat> and he was saying that um, when he got students at the seminary, at, at the Baptist seminary, they all like to, they took to the Bible like a fish to water. They were very comfortable with it. Lutheran students, though, aren't. They're very comfortable with uh, theology, but less comfortable with the story of the Bible. They just haven't read it as much. So what I'm saying is, is that the Baptist, they have the same Bible and they read it a ton and they still struggle with the same thing. I have Roman Catholic friends who also struggle with trying to justify themselves by their works. Um, I, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular right now, but I'm sure that I've got Methodist and Presbyterian friends who are struggling with the same thing. I have non-believing friends. I have friends who aren't Christians who are trying to justify themselves you know, with their attractiveness or the amount of money they make or their academic prowess or whatever, their golf game. So it is the human problem, and we know about it. As a Christian, I know it's not possible. It's I think a lot of non-Christians know it's not possible, too. That's an endless rat race trying to make yourself worthy with your own deeds. But we as Christians know that it's not possible, but we also know that it's been given to us in Jesus Christ, and yet we still try to earn our own justification. There's, there's a recovering fundamentalist in, in each one of us or a fundamentalist who's still in fundamentalism and um, always fighting that, and it's 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 the universal problem. I don't, I don't seriously, I don't, do not want to, uh, you know, I picked the topic today just because I used to be a fundamentalist, and because I can probably talk a little bit about it. I'm, I did not pick it because I, I, I consider it to be some sort of like, well, they should be more like me now. I, I, honestly, like, I still struggle with the same things I struggled back then with a little bit more insight now into to God's grace for me in Jesus Christ and in the impossibility of being sanctified by doing good things, but I still struggle with it. So we seem to have come to the fork in the road here. We should be doing good things. We're, we're not exempt as grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone people from doing good things. The issue seems to be that when we do good things, who do we credit for the outcome of doing a good thing? And you know that you've preached good sermons. You've had people say to you, I really got a lot out of your sermon today. So you got confirmation that you did preach a good sermon. So now the question is, what do you do with that? Do you say, hey, God, how about that? Huh? Huh? Pretty happy with me today? Or do you say all the credit for that particularly beneficial sermon belongs to God. That's the fork in the road. Which way do you go? And it brings to mind, not to be too overtly Lutheran here, the first of Martin Luther's very famous 95 theses. And that first one, paraphrasing, is that the whole Christian life ought to be one of repentance every day, 24-7, so that 
after you have acknowledged, and I join you, that in some ways I, we are still trying to justify ourselves and earn God's favor, the answer to that is repentance. Am I on the right path here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the biblical answer is, is you can't. And so ask God to forgive you. Ask him for the strength to turn from your sin to him and then trust him that he has forgiven you and will empower you imperfectly until until he come until Jesus returns and wraps the whole thing up but he will empower you to do what's right our our own efforts are fruitless especially when um so th- there's two issues here one is trying to do good works to please God I don't know of any Baptist pastor who I had growing up who would say I preached a good sermon now God's happy with me well, we all know that that's wrong but it's this I have to keep I have to do right or God's going to be unhappy with me it's that sense that lingers behind all of life. The other, the, the second piece is adding rules to God's word to try and protect, like the Pharisees, to try and protect God's law by adding rules to, uh, to, to you know, to, to set up to, to function as a barrier to keep us as far away from sin as possible. And, you know, Paul says in Colossians that that, that this temptation to make up rules. He says, you know, and he's talking about rules, don't eat, don't touch, don't do these unworldly things. He says in Colossians, they have an appearance of godliness in promoting uh, bodily asceticism, but they're powerless to stop the lust of the flesh. And that's one of the things that I I realized almost right away growing up in in fundamentalism is is that I was dressing a certain way. And I wasn't going to movies, and I wasn't listening to bad kind of music, and I still struggled with sin. I still was broken. The sin was coming from inside of me, not from outside of me. And so this attempt to keep sin from outside of us is completely misguided. It underestimates the capacity of the human heart to create its own sin and thus cuts us off from repentance. If the problem is the culture, then the culture needs to change, and we're right. But if like the Luther quote that you gave from the 95 Theses is the, if the problem is my own sinful human heart, then I need to repent. I need to ch- ch- Now, do I need to t- take and steps? And you're going to need to repent tomorrow. All the time. And the next day. Yeah. And I'm going to need to take steps to, to, to keep myself out of situations that will exacerbate my sinfulness. I need to not look at certain things on the internet. There's some types of music that I probably shouldn't listen to. But, but this isn't because those things are bad, and it isn't definitely because by not doing those things, I'm making God happy. It's because I personally am a sinner who needs to repent and 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 come to live under the, the power of the gospel afresh every day. And it's the problem is me. The problem is me, and I must repent. So let's uh, just create a hypothetical here to wrap things up. Suppose somebody this week— in your circle of acquaintances says, well, it wouldn't be this week because this program will not have dropped until a couple of weeks. But anyway, I heard your program on Christian fundamentalism. And as I listened, because that's kind of the way I see myself, I was kind of upset in the beginning. But as I listened, I came to uh, have some pretty serious questions. And so you're dealing with somebody who is identifying as a fundamentalist, but has an open mind to some of the things that they will have heard in this uh, podcast. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to are you going to put that off? Are you going to not discourage, but uh, maybe change the direction? Or are you going to grab it by the throat? And how are you going to handle that? I'll probably say, yeah, me too. You know, I grew up as a fundamentalist. I actually, you know, I, I've uh, me, me too. L- let's repent together. Let's be let's be mindful of this and repent together, and let's not be prideful. I um, I've been kind of uh, I don't want to get in trouble here, and I don't even know who listens to this podcast, but uh, it, it would be easy for me to say the church I came out of was fundamentalist, but the church I'm in now isn't, and that's just not true. There's much about the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod that's fundamentalistic. And I don't just mean the doctrine, but with which I agree, but this notion that we're right and everybody else is wrong, 
Isn't that the way everybody yes. views their own perspective? Yes, of course. But the problem is, is that when it leads us to say the problem with the world is out there and not in our church, that the world is the problem. And not, so I, I, I quoted this in a sermon just recently, and some of our listeners will have heard this at some point in their lives. It's a, kind of a famous story about a, a, a London newspaper, which was doing a series of essays by thinkers. This is back in the early 1900s on what's wrong with the world. And they asked G.K. Chesterton to, to contribute. And he wrote, just wrote in a letter and said, dear gentlemen, I am signed G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world is us. What's wrong with the world is the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. This is my church. And what's wrong, listener, if you, if you go to a different church, what's wrong with the world is your church. And if we start to think that the problems are out there, we'll develop high levels of pride, which was a characteristic of the churches I grew up in, uh, very much like we are right and they're wrong. And that pride, again, undermines the gospel. If I'm right, I don't need the gospel. If the gospel's job is just to teach me how to be right, and then once I'm right, I've got it, then I don't have the gospel. The gospel, the gospel's job is to rescue me from the sinfulness that's buried deep inside my own human heart and deep inside the heart of my own congregation and my own synod. And so we constantly need the gospel to turn us away from ourselves and to convince us afresh that God loves us in Jesus Christ and has forgiven us our sins because he died on the cross and rose from the dead for us. Well, I guess we started out, I had kind of a vague perception of what Christian fundamentalism is. I'm not sure that I've got total clarity now, but I know a lot more than I did before. (laughs) Here on Craving Answers, Craving God, we like to think that we tackle subjects and questions that are top of mind. I invite you to explore our ever-growing playlist of shows, which includes some topics that were suggested by you. We welcome and encourage your suggestions and comments. For Pastor Aaron Miller and our production manager, Larry O'Leary, I'm Chuck Rather.